The last four years have been hell. They've been an, a terrible time to live through. And it was very frustrating for us as a family to be over here and not knowing uh, if the man who killed Justine was going to stand trial. This was hovering in the background all the time. The phone ringing at one, two and three o'clock in the morning because it was US time, not knowing what any, you know, what each phone call is going to be. Very difficult for Justine's family. Dealing with an event that happens 9,500 miles away, trying to remain dignified while they were watching a lot of undignified things. To this day, we still really are, are bewildered at how it happened. After a court case and two appeals, we still don't understand. 530, uh, shots fired. Can we get EMS code 3 Washburn and 51st Street? Yeah, one down. Copy. 530, I'm starting to figure Squad 530, are you code 4 for medical? 530, code 4 for medical. 520, where is the EMS on this? The EMS is coming, rescue is coming. That night, I told Justine to call 911. I had this conception that when she said, the police are here, that I felt all's well, like the knights in shining armor have arrived. And I'll never feel that again. It doesn't add up. That's the problem for us. It doesn't add up. Why a policeman would shoot a woman in her pyjamas. This is a shocking killing. It is inexplicable. The lack of video evidence is making it harder to piece together exactly what happened. We want justice, so we need the truth to come out. We want to know the reason why she was shot. Why is she dead? Not just who pulled the trigger, but why. Justine Demond is the fifth person to be fatally shot by police in Minnesota this year. Her death did turn everything on its head, you know. Started to question, what are these officers thinking? There's no excuse for it. If she can be shot, any 911 caller, any mother in her pajamas, anybody can be shot. I'm drinking coffee. I feel great. I feel excited. She was very comfortable in America. And she was so happy with Dom. We've often commented on the culture of violence in America, but we really didn't ever think it would touch us. Justine and I met in a meditation retreat in Colorado Springs. The connection that I felt was beyond anything I've ever experienced. My dad said that he kind of like followed her around like a little dog and she went skydiving. He watched her fall out of the plane and just thought and said, uh, that's the girl that I'm gonna marry. So I came home and I told all my friends and my family that I just met my future wife. And they said, great, when can we meet her? I said, well, she lives 9,000 miles away. <laughs> to suddenly start to imagine that there was the love of her life in another country miles away was a little unsettling for her, but yet it wouldn't go away. She was becoming more and more enamored with this man who she connected on every level with. I didn't know that this had progressed past, you know, just a casual conversation until the day she called me up and she said, Dad, I, I found the guy I love and I'm probably going to America. Whoops. <laughs> I didn't want to lose her and I believe that Australia is a, a great place to live. And so I was hoping that she'd bring him back here. Jesse! Jazzy and I grew up on northern beaches in Sydney. One, two, three. <laughs> no! You Mum's Australian. She studied nursing in Sydney. My dad's American. After he finished his studies, he started travelling and met Mum overseas. 
They got married. I was beginning to question some of the things that were happening in America. I mean, there was lots of conflict in the streets. Demonstrations at universities around the country where there were violence, there were riots. Things were disruptive. I was looking for a different kind of social environment and um, Australia appealed to me. Justine, as a child, was just one of those wonderful you know, little girls. Very verbal and very determined. Straight A's all the time, without much effort. Jason, move out of the way. So you back up, Justine. Now I'm trying to feel my feet. Get away! Get away! There were always animals involved in Justine's life. Margaret was a member of Wires, and our backyard was full of possums and birds. If that influenced Justine to become a vet, I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing. Our first year of vet school was, was wonderful and exciting. But as we went into our second year, Justine's mum, Margaret, was um, ailing from, from cancer. So I took some time off work and looked after mum at home. And then she, she had to get moved to a hospital and then she ultimately passed away. Justine graduated with honors. She was doing locum work in the UK for about a year. And at that time, something changed in her life. She sort of put veterinary science on the back burner then. And she was really going through some tough times. And we talked about what we'd been through with mum and how she was really still struggling with the grief and the loss. She wanted to save everyone from pain and hurt. She wanted to save animals, she wanted to save people. I think she probably wanted to save her mother. That's one of the things that was deeply passionate about her. She went to an ashram in India. She wanted to understand a lot more spirituality where she could help people and help herself and heal herself. She became interested in how much control the mind could have on the body's health. Could you slow down the progress of an illness or something? So she became interested in studying neuroscience, brain waves and scanning and how meditation can control the body. I never reached a, an end where I was totally satisfied that I understood what she was looking for, but it was certainly a lifelong quest on her part. Once she settled back in Sydney, she started teaching meditation, workshops and courses. I've never seen someone so proactive in um, fixing themselves. And then out of the blue, she, she met Don. The original plan, I think, was for Don to come to Australia, but Juzzy and Don decided that they should go back to Minneapolis. We got close very quickly, and she felt like a, another mom to me. It was just two guys living here together, and then she literally came in and just made it a home, and little juzzy things showed up everywhere, like gnomes and fairies and stuffed animals and her art or pieces of Australia. From Niagara Falls, reporting live. <laughs> <laughs> when she got here in December, I gave her a gift, and her gift was a fleece, wool socks, a hat, and gloves. Because <laughs> it was December, you know? It was a matter of months before she was doing her work teaching. She went to Lake Harriet Spiritual Community and quickly found a home there, found a place for her voice to be heard. 
So um, I originally trained as a veterinary surgeon and now working uh, to teach people about themselves uh, from the level of quantum physics, from the level of neuroscience so that you can learn about how your brain works and how you can use it to create the state of health that you want and the life that you want. She was a strong woman. It took a while to get there, but she was there and that's why she was so, I guess, powerful. I wanted you to get married in Hawaii. She wanted to ask formally, ask the kids to be page boy and flower girl. The wedding was to be in August. So Justine obviously had many things to do before the wedding. And we were in contact, you know, a few times a day over that period. I'd spoken to her in the morning and she had been talking about the bridesmaids dresses arriving and how excited she was about that. I was away, I was out of town on a business trip on a Saturday. So Justine was, was home alone. Justine was convinced that she heard someone in extreme distress in the back laneway. And so much so that she'd called Don. She'd heard someone that she thought was being raped. It didn't stop, so she called him again and he said, Call 911. Hi. Um, I can hear someone out the back, and I, I'm not sure if she's having sex or being raped. And there's a lane out the back. Yep. Yep. And I think she just yelled out, help. She did what any Aussie woman would do. Go to the police, because you know it's safe, and they're going to get to the answer of it. In this case, it was the wrong decision. We gather that she still heard this noise and she called 911 a second time to say it's been eight minutes or something and there's still no one here. Okay, I've already got an officer on the way. What is your name? Justine. They were rookie cops. We know they didn't have their dash camera on. They didn't have their body cameras on. For some reason, she went out into the laneway behind her house. I can only suppose that she came out of the house and realizing that the police car had gone past the site of the incident, that she walked up to the police car. For some unknown reason, the man shot her and killed her. None of it made sense. Absolutely none of it made sense. It's such a paradox in the way that she died. She lived her life as a peaceful person, inspiring others. She helped people transform their lives. She transformed her own life. Justine was a beacon to all of us. We only ask that the light of justice shine down on the circumstances of her death. Sadly, her family and I have been provided with almost no additional information from law enforcement regarding what happened after police arrived. Shut it down! Shut it down! So a few days after Justine was killed, our neighborhood held a rally. We gonna be all right! People from the African American community they came down and were present here on the block with us. We didn't understand this at all until this happened to Justine. I mean, I still can't relate to what the African American communities are going through and the vulnerability that they feel. When I first heard about Justine being killed, I said, man, that's tragic, and I automatically sent people over there. In no just society should you be the one calling police for help and end up dead. So here, we have a long-standing problem and it's time for us to fix it. 
The police shooting of Australian Justine de Monde has caused political upheaval in the city of Minneapolis. The officer who pulled the trigger is Mohammed Noor. Noor has refused to give evidence to investigators and today officials admitted that they can't force him to break his silence. About two weeks after Juzzy passed away, we all flew over to Minneapolis. We spent a lot of time walking up and down that laneway, trying to visualise what happened. The information that we get from the media is that maybe there was someone slapping the back of a car. Even if that's true, it's not in my mind enough to be a startling factor where there's no other criminal activity going on. We realised that there was a possibility that we'd be unhappy with the way the police force investigated. Somebody took my daughter's life for no reason. And I think that's a crime. And I'd like to see him in court. We're waiting to hear from the state prosecutor about whether he will make the determination of whether to lay charges on Noor. If they decide not to charge him, then the civil case that we want to bring will start earlier. My family came up with Bob Bennett. He fights police malfeasance and violence, and he likes to fight those public cases. Justine's case is a civil rights case. This is a use of force that is so beyond the pale that it would cause other people to not call the police. Well, the city of Minneapolis has historically had problems with the use of excessive force. We've had more problems here with shootings because of some of the way that officers are being trained today in Justine's case. I can't imagine they teach officers that one of the good lanes of fire is across the lap of their driving partner. You know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Before Justine's death, it was only a year before that Philando Castile uh, was killed. Philando Castile and his girlfriend were driving one evening. He was pulled over by a suburban police officer named uh, Geronimo Yanez. He approaches the car. Philando tells him that he has a gun permit to conceal and carry and tells him where his gun is. Don't pull it out. You have a panicky officer who begins shooting. Stay with me. We got pulled over for a busted tail light in the back. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. He was reaching for his wallet, and the officer just shot him in his arm. It seems ludicrous that somebody would be pulled over for a minor traffic infraction and wind up dead. Yanez was charged with manslaughter, a number of charges, I think unlawful discharge. <sighs> he walked out of there with, without being convicted of anything. We wanted a conviction for that because if Philando couldn't get justice in that case, we don't really understand which case there will be justice. We're hopeful, but I mean, with those odds, it's not looking great that there's going to be even be charges be laid, um, let alone there be a conviction. So what's the latest in the Star Tribune? Do you have anything? We sat around waiting for a very long time. We listened to the discussions that were taking place in Minneapolis where the prosecution was trying to decide what to charge him with, if anything. He's broken his silence on a charter amendment. And it was just suspense the whole time. But eventually we heard that Nora had been charged. Tonight, the US police officer who shot Australian woman Justine Damon charged with murder. The trial date was set. The family decided to go, all of us. No one was under any illusions here that this was just about Muhammad Noor. The entire Minneapolis Police Department was on trial. Why did you shit Justine? Mr. Norman, you still say that you have been scared at the time? 
Right is right and wrong is wrong. Doesn't matter what the color of the cop is. If you take someone's life, you ought to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. So this was a very complex case that really split Minneapolis along different racial lines. The other officers that killed black men, shot them multiple times, shot them in the head, no charges. Minneapolis is the home of America's Somali community and they felt that one of their officers was being used as a scapegoat when many other white officers had done the same thing and been let off. The th thrust of the prosecution's argument was that Noor's use of force, of fatal force, was unjustified. Mohammed Noor's defence was that he was acting reasonably as a police officer. He and his partner, Officer Matthew Harrity, say that they heard a loud slap on the car. Mohammed Noor said that he saw a blonde woman in a pink shirt raising her right hand and believed that his partner's life was at risk and so fired the fatal shot that killed Justine. It was immensely stressful for all of us. The videos of the incident, the videos of Justine lying on the pavement, dying, were utterly terrible. Harity, what's going on? Harity said his excuse was he was nervous, he, he was spooked. She just came up out of nowhere on the side of the thing. We both got spooked. But Nora and Harity did not mention uh, this ambush, this bang on the car, till well after the, they'd talked to people at the scene. Just keep yourself, keep your mouth shut till you have to say anything. They had plenty of time to cook that up, which we believe they did. Officer Harity testified that he wouldn't have shot, did not see any reason to shoot. Any reaction to your partner's testimony today, Mohammed Noor? The jury was out for five hours. We were just anxious, utterly anxious, nervous. And then the jury came in. First charge of second degree murder was not guilty. So we had to hold our breath on the others. But then she read the next charge, third degree murder, guilty. Manslaughter, guilty. Several activists with Justice for Justine, quite honestly, appeared to be overcome with emotion. Everyone in Minneapolis was really on tenterhooks waiting for this verdict. We celebrate that some form of justice has occurred this week. His conviction was the first murder conviction of a police officer, I, I think, nationwide. And I've been practicing 45 years, and, you know, you just don't see those kinds of convictions. He was given 12 and a half years, we felt satisfied, I think, that, that justice had been done. Within days of the trial ending, Justine's lawyers were pursuing uh, another matter. They were trying to get civil compensation for a wrongful death claim. We said, this has to set a new benchmark. We want this to set a new benchmark for what it, a human life is worth is Minneapolis. Well, the case, I think, was transformative. We were able to settle a case for $20 million, which uh, the New York Times reported was the largest such settlement in the history of the United States at the time. And it was hopes that it would deter future activities, but alas, uh, it did not. You trapped in his breathing right there, bro. When George Floyd was killed, the first thing I think I said to John was, well, nothing's changed. Get back in the Check. The man ain't moved yet, bro. The man ain't this moved. This was different to Justine's killing because this murder was filmed on the street. There was no way for the Minneapolis Police Department to deny, deflect, or spin this. This was a city ready to explode. And that's exactly what happened. What's his name? My reaction to the murder of George Floyd was horror. Unfortunately, I have a certain understanding about the Minneapolis Police Department. The whole damn system is guilty as hell! Their officers can feel they can do this sort of thing with impunity. 
It's essentially the same thing they've been doing since I've got out of law school in 1976. As far as I can tell, that tiger has not changed its stripes. A few months after the George Floyd murder, the Minneapolis police were back in the news. Mohammed Noor was appealing his third degree murder conviction. An ex-Minneapolis police officer could soon be out of jail. We were worried, and then all of a sudden it gets to the Supreme Court, and they overturn the third degree murder charge. I really didn't think it would happen. It's been terrible. So last month, that meant that Mohammed Noor came back before the court to be sentenced on the lesser charge of manslaughter. We have a resentencing, obviously, to do this morning. Justine's family basically felt completely let down. I'll begin with the statement of uh, Ms. Ruschek's uh, parents. This is the second time our family has had to experience the distress, trial, and injustice for the utterly gratuitous murder of Justine. But there was an extraordinary moment as Justine's former fiancé, Don Damon, addressed the court. Justine was and is still my greatest teacher. Given her example, I forgive you, Mom. All I ask is that you use this experience to do good for other people. The maximum she could, uh, Judge Quaintance could have sentenced him to was 57 months, and she did so. And she did so with a clear explanation, as clear as she was in her initial sentencing about the nature of the wrong of the conduct. The questions of the jurors remain unanswered. What has changed? What will change so that this does not happen again? The jurors and the people of Minneapolis need and deserve answers. The murder of Justine was an, an obscenity and was something that civil society should not accept. And the police officer has to be held accountable and has to pay a penalty. And I don't think he's paying a fair penalty. I don't think he is. After this final resentencing, we hope that this is the end of one chapter and that we can turn it over and, and start again and renew without, of course, forgetting about the past. Justine's story is part of the mosaic and a big piece of the mosaic of police misconduct in, in Minneapolis and in the United States as a whole. Justine will live on in the memory of people in Minneapolis. She provoked a large response from people of all parts of life. I think there's a lot more people who are pushing for change, stemming from Justine and stemming from George Floyd. So hopefully that that's you know, reached a tipping point where there will be change. Our loss cannot be without some kind of positive outcome. Justine's life should not be in vain.